Hi, and welcome to the Collective Impact Podcast. A collective impact is when communities collaborate, share resources, and learn together in a structured way to create equity-enhancing change. I'm Mina Yildiz, and I founded this podcast to uplift the stories of historically marginalized groups and people within the Madison, Wisconsin community, and to celebrate their work in helping create a better world. I invite listeners to pay attention to how systems of oppression impact people's experiences and to be aware of how these systems may affect your life or the people around you. I hope this podcast can inspire listeners to share their own stories, nurture their passions, and become a part of creating systems-level change. Uh, hello, my name is Aaron Birdbear. I'm a citizen of the Mandan, Hadatsa, and Arikara Nations, but I am Mandan, Hadatsa, and Diné as well. I could be enrolled either in the Navajo Nation, but we call ourselves the Diné. The Spanish called us Navajo. Um, uh, but I'm, my parents chose to enroll me in the Mandan, Hadatsa, and Rikra Nation, of which I'm Mandan and Hadatsa. Um, those are indigenous nations from the Central Plains and from the Southwest of this continent. Um, and I've worked at University of Wisconsin-Madison for 23 years. I started as the American Indian Student Academic Services Coordinator um, from 2000 to 2008. I then worked in the School of Education uh, here at UW-Madison in, in a couple different roles, uh, eventually becoming assistant dean for student diversity programs in the School of Education. And then currently, I'm the director of tribal relations, an appointment that started with uh, an appointment in university relations and the division of extension. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And we'll get into that a bit later in the interview, just to kind of talk about what those roles look like and how they became to be. Um, but before that, um, before anything, really, I wanted to do the icebreaker activity, which has been kind of something that I want to be able to do in each interview, which would just be you sharing a quote, a phrase, or a saying that has personal meaning, um, and then sharing why that does. Um, for a long time, I had a quote as my email signature when I was an assistant dean in the School of Education, and I think it just kind of uh, summarized very well how we Indigenous peoples have um, you know, threaded the needle and are thriving more than we have in recent years in the 21st century. And it was a, a quote by the principal chief of the Cherokee Nation, uh, Wilma Mankiller. She's also the first uh, woman to hold that role in the modern Cherokee Nation. Um, and I got to see her speak at the University of Washington, Seattle, while I was a student there. And so she provided a lot of insight and guidance to us as Indigenous students at the University of Washington during her visit. And so the quote I had in my email is like, <laughs> It's like, I can't remember exactly how to paraphrase it. The secret, our, our, the secret of our success is that we never, never give up. And we think about, you know, indigenous peoples, and here they are, the Cherokee, they've endured, uh, you know, uh, ethnic cleansing campaigns against them to remove them from their ancestral home in what is now Georgia and South Carolina to be in what is now the state of Oklahoma. Uh, we think about kind of the persistence they had to have, you know, in that incredibly horrific uh, ethnic cleansing journey they had to sustain. Um, I think about my ancestors, 95% of our population died from uh, several smallpox epidemics, a couple which were instigated as biological warfare from the US government against our peoples to try to uh, kind of form a genocide to wipe us out. And so I think about us that in the year 1900, there are only 237,000 Native Americans alive in what is the United States today. And so myself and other, every other Native American, American Indian Alaska Native person you meet, is a descendant of those 237,000 people who survived the colonization of the United States, a population from 6 million to 237,000 in pretty short order. So we lost about 95% of our collective population as a, as a indigenous peoples of this continent. And yet here we are thriving in the 21st century. And so I love uh, Wilma Van Killer's quote, um, you know, the secret of our success is that we never, never give up. And I heard you say that I got chills too. Um, really the persisting and not giving up and the power that that holds as a community and as people and what that brings into each day is so powerful as well. Um, so thank you for giving the background of the quote, the background, the history, the meaning. Um, thank you so much. Um, to kind of bring it back to uh, your personal experiences, I wanted to start all the way at the beginning with your childhood. So understanding the background, what your childhood was like and how those experiences or how your family has shaped you today. So the first question, very simple, where were you born, uh, state, city, um, location in general? Yeah, I was born in Hanover, New Hampshire, uh, which is unusual for myself being, a, my parents are Mandan, Hadatsa, 
uh, my father's side and Diné on my mother's side, and they grew up uh, in their kind of ancestral territories. Um, but my parents were part of a really uh, innovative educational program for Indigenous students in the kind of 1960s called the United Scholarship Service. And so my parents were both identified as really promising students, and they were put into prestigious prep schools, preparatory schools. So my mother went to Santa Fe Prep School in Santa Fe, New Mexico. My father went to Phillips Exeter Boys Academy, which is in uh, New Hampshire, I believe. And uh, it's, it's where Je George W. Bush went. You know, it's a really prestigious prep school on the East Coast. Um, and they'd convened my, the scholars during the summers. And so my parents met, uh, really solidified their relationship in the summer of 1968 with the March on the War on Poverty in Washington, D.C. And uh, my brother was born in 1969. And I was born in 1971. And I was born in Hamden, New Hampshire, because my father had begun when the returning Native American students to Dartmouth College. And so my, my father was a student at Dartmouth College when I was born. That's why I was born out in New Hampshire versus being born at the three affiliated tribes or, or somewhere else. Um, so my brother and I are kind of uh, college products of uh, United Scholars, United Scholarship Service Scholars, uh, my parents, um, who are both part of that program. And it was just a wonderful kind of leadership program that uh, developed a lot of Native American scholars. Yeah. Wow. That's really amazing. Um, just the clarify again so your parents met when they were doing the march it's like yeah they, well they were part of the scholars in in the summer of 68 they convened the united scholarship service scholars in washington dc mm -hmm. um it happened to be the summer of the march on the war on poverty and so both my parents participated in that event and it just kind of part of their uh, beginning of their relationship in some way and uh and then my brother was born in 1969 a year later and then I was born a couple of years after that. My parents were really young. They were 17 when they got pregnant with my brother and 19 when they got pregnant with me. So I had very young parents, uh, kind of you know, college going uh, students at the time uh, while my brother and I were born. Yeah, my um, I grew up with my mom while she was pursuing school as well. And um, it takes a lot to be able to raise a family and also academically be engaged. And um, it's just, I, I admire the strength, especially with the single mother, um, being able to balance those things I know can be a bit hard. Um, but how would you say was like, what was your experience in New Hampshire? Did you enjoy growing up there? Well, I didn't remember. I mean, I, we, we left there when I was like, uh, you know, less than a year old. I see. Um, my, my father finished his degree and then they, they bounced out of New Hampshire. <laughs> Um, we then moved back. I've lived, I've lived, not visited, I've lived in 11 states in the United States. So, um, you know, part of having very young parents who are then pursuing their educations and college degrees and, and then, you know, jobs, and then my own pursuit of education myself. So, you know, I was born in New Hampshire, but we moved back to the three affiliated tribes uh, in uh, Newtown in Mandaree on our reservation for a little while. My father then got a job in Minnesota working at McAllister College. And so we moved to Minnesota for that work. Um, my parents then decided they really would benefit from having law degrees um, mm -hmm. to do the work they wanted to advocate for indigenous peoples. And so my mother also had to drop out of school, uh, her college career. She was going to Sarah Lawrence University, but in the late 1960s, they didn't really have student parent housing. You know, So thinking about the needs of student parents in the 1960s, uh, so my mom had dropped out, but she wanted to pick up her undergraduate degree again. And so we moved to Denver where my parent, my mother finished her undergraduate, her law degree and her MBA um, at the University of Denver while I was a child, kind of my elementary to middle school years, she was going to college. Uh, my, my parents broke up, unfortunately, when I was two uh, because teenage relationships often don't last. Um, and so although my parents were going to the same university for their law degree, they were kind of divorced at that time. So I, I grew up with a single parent mother for the most part, my Diné mother, uh, Roberta Carroll Harvey, um, in the kind of student parent housing of the University of Denver. Wow. Could you tell me a little bit about your mom's work? Um, you said she was pursuing a law degree to uh, do advocation for Indigenous peoples. Yeah, well, both my parents did. Um, you know, both my parents got their law degrees from the University of Denver. And uh, my father went to work for the Environmental Protection Agency at the time because that was a hotbed of Indian land rights issues in the 1970s and early 1980s. Uh, he then progressed into the Bureau of Indian Affairs where he became a superintendent on various reservations. And so, uh, you know, BIA superintendents can help with kind of tribal governance matters and uh, you know, getting more kind of land back into trust for tribal nations and different activities. So my father had done that way. My mother had to pay the bills for two kids since my, my parents had broken up. So she took a corporate job as an energy attorney. 
Um, so she worked for her career for about 20 something years for an energy company. But then later in life, she took that knowledge and worked for a law firm in the Southwest called Nordhaus that represents a lot of Native Americans energy interests and water rights. My mother knows that kind of the back of her hand. So she then helped Native Americans with their energy needs and water rights in the Southwest as an attorney for uh, Nordhaus. And then she briefly became the Colorado Commissioner of Indian Affairs uh, with her kind of energy expertise and, and um, the two Native nations uh, that are, remain in, in Colorado after the ethnic cleansing of Colorado are the Utes and the Ute Mountain Utes. So two Ute tribes and, and they're natural gas tribes. And so my mom was able to, you know, hopefully represent their interests well as the Colorado Commissioner of Indian Affairs. So, you know, then my parents did two routes. You know, my mom first went corporate, then they came back to using that expertise to benefit Native nations and Indigenous peoples. My father out of the gate had, had tried to use his law degree to advance the needs of Indigenous peoples in some way. And growing up and seeing that happen, do you say, like, in what ways do you feel inspired? Uh, inspired you now and as a child as well? Well, my parents are really hardcore, you know, so they're young. You have to remember that they're not like old parents, you know, like I'm in elementary school and they're like 24, 25 years old, you know, so they're, they're pretty young people and they're very energetic. And so I remember them as college students. They were, uh, you know, fighting for their civil rights as college students, right? So it's, it's hard to remember that uh, Native Americans were not included in the 1964 Civil Rights Act because of our political status. You know, we're political minorities under U.S. law. We're not racial minorities because of our uh, treaty-based relationships between our tribal governments and the government of the United States. Um, and so you know, my parents were fighting for their civil rights. Uh, in 1968, uh, the Indigenous Civil Indian Civil Rights Act was passed. So they went from officially second-class citizens to first-class citizens while they were college students. And then, you know, kind of seeing this sea change happen in the United States, they were occupying a lot of buildings as college students. So uh, Dartmouth College used to be called the Dartmouth Indians, uh, kind of derogatory Native American mascot associated with it. As the returning Native American students to Dartmouth, they felt that was inappropriate. University wasn't really listening to them. So then they occupied the president's office for two straight weeks. Uh, there's photos of my infant brother. He's my older brother in, as part of that occupation. So it's a kind of intergenerational occupation of indigenous community of the president's office at Dartmouth College to force them to change uh, the Native American mascot and name, which was changed. So it became the Dartmouth Big Green eventually. And my parents helped start the Native American Native Americans at Dartmouth program uh, that remains there today. Um, while also during college, during the summers, uh, they were occupying federal buildings. So uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs office in Littleton, Colorado, uh, they had part of the protested and occupied that facility uh, during, their, during their college years as well. So my parents were direct action kind of advocates in the 1960s and early 70s era of Indian activism. Um, they then took that kind of activist spirit and took it into the law. And then instead of taking over buildings, you know, learning what strategic lawsuits and how they can support tribal governance in different ways. And so, you know, I think about my parents' motto or, or just kind of model of if you care about the needs of indigenous peoples, then you, you have to educate yourself. Um, you have to develop yourself to be able to help people in some way, shape or form. And then you have to take a stand based on the kind of knowledge you have about Indian law or the rights of sovereign indigenous nations or the rights of indigenous peoples and uh, continue to advocate for them. Since the most of US society knows little to nothing about Native Americans, there's, yeah, I think a, a survey, the First Nations Institute did a survey a few years ago and they found that four out of five U.S. citizens know little to nothing about Native Americans. And that's not a coincidence. That's by design. Um, the U.S. is a settler colonial society where the organizing principle and goal of all settler colonial societies is replacement. In this case, replacement of the indigenous thought societies, indigenous knowledge of this continent. Um, and so, uh, you know, that knowledge, that gross ignorance of Native Americans is by design. And so, you know, we as indigenous peoples, despite us only being 1% or 2% of the population today, we have a lot of work to do considering there's so much gross ignorance about Native Americans and kind of the political status of Native Americans and the associated kind of civil rights that, that are accorded to Native Americans. And so uh, I think about their motto from direct action to education to law. And it just kind of reminded me, if you care about the needs of indigenous peoples, then you have to educate yourself, develop yourself to have some capacities to serve indigenous peoples in some way. In my case, that's education. Uh, and then you have to take a stand. You have to kind of, uh, since there's so much gross ignorance at both, at, at every leadership level and every public institution of the United States, if it's not indigenous uh, kind of coordinated, is going to have gross ignorance. And so there's going to be a lot of educating and a lot of work to do. And so I think about my parents' kind of model that they provided for my, my brother and I of, you know, educate yourself, become useful, and then go do something positive. Yeah. And that can really work in all ways of life. Um, 
that is amazing that model itself I wrote it down here so I can also glance at that when I um, pursue because I am still early in my college years and I do want to be able to and somehow achieve direct action and uh, education is such a powerful tool and you know being part of the education institution and being part of you know spreading that knowledge spreading that education and power is just a really inspirational thing so thank you um the next thing I wanted to ask is, was there a lesson that you learned specifically from your childhood or from your parents that um, kind of shaped how you approach life now? Yeah, I, my father, uh, although he, you know, my parents had divorced, uh, he did take us from time to time when we were children back up to our reservation community to connect with our relatives and be part of the community of the three affiliated tribes. And uh, one time he took us back when I was in kindergarten, I was a little, I was like five years old. Uh, he took us back there, and, and we didn't really know what was going on. Uh, my brother's a year and a half older than me, so he's in first grade. I was in kindergarten. My father woke us up. It was like before sunrise. He said, we got to go somewhere. I'm like, okay. And he said, you got to wear, dress warmly because you're going to be outside for the next few hours. Uh, make sure to wear your tennis shoes. You know? uh, I'm like, okay. Uh, so I'm wearing like my, my, my little, like I've got a little, little pants. I was wearing some sort of pants and jeans, like a puffy parka, and my, my high top running shoes, uh, you know. I top my basketball shoes, I guess, or some sort of shoes I had on. And um, and my my father takes us to a place on the reservation and all the boys, there's lots of boys there. So there's a lot of these young boys that are all kind of being rounded up together. We're not sure what's going to happen. They said, today you run, today you run. And, um, you know, I come from uh, the Mandan and Hadatsa are both running cultures, kind of like we associate with like Ethiopia and Kenya, these kind of running cultures of, of the nations of Africa. And so running was just a really high esteem kind of held activity within our community. Um, people forget that the horse uh, is not indigenous to this continent and it was brought by the Spanish and other people in colonization activities in this hemisphere. And my tribe, we call ourselves the heart of the world because we're in the very center, geographic center of the North American continent. So we were the last people to kind of be reached by colonizers, a U.S. society and others. Uh, so the horse also got to us last and very late. Um, we took to it once we had the horse in number, but before that, you know, running was a very, very important part of our culture, pre-horse culture, right? Um, and so, you know, we we're buffalo hunters, bison hunters. Um, we did a lot of hunting bison on teams on foot um, by rounding them up, uh, uh, you know, and steering them off little buffalo jumps, these small kind of cliffs, an eight, 10 foot cliff is a really great buffalo jump. And you, if you can steer some bison over it, they'll break their legs up on the fall and you can collect dinner at that point. So kind of team running uh, was really important. Uh, runners kind of delivering messages between communities are really important. So running has always been a really central part of our community. And what I didn't realize is my father was bringing us on a rite of passage run. So uh, it's a, a run that our young people in our community are, are asked to do because it teaches them their capacities to have inside of all, of all of us. Each of us have great capacities we don't recognize. So I'm only five years old and uh, I'm in my jeans and parka and I now have to run a 10K, a six mile race. Wow. And so I don't even know how long it is. I'm just told to run, you know, and, and in the end, I find out it's six miles after running it for like an hour. Um, but I remember as being a fifth grader, you know, running a six mile race and how painful it was, you know, the last mile, my legs, my quads are all just completely fried and, and they just feel like mashed potatoes inside my legs. You know, they, they feel so weird as I'm running. They don't feel great at all. Um, I didn't know I was doing really well. I was apparently second. Uh, my, my my father had also run earlier in the day, and then he came up beside me in his car, and I thought he was going to say something nice to me. He just yelled, "Fractor," you know, and, and uh, so just uh, making me run even harder because I didn't realize, you know, I was, I, there's only one kid ahead of me at this point. And um, and and so what that rite of passage taught me is that th we have so much more inside of us than we realize. There's just so many more depths to our capacities that we realize. And, and here, this run that was designed uh, by, our, by our community, our ancestors, who recognized, you know, we need to have these experiences to, to learn the real capacities that we have as human beings. And, and so I'm really thankful for that childhood experience, that rite of passage run on a reservation that my father took us to, uh, because it taught me how much I really have inside and what it's like to go deep inside, to dig when you think that you can't keep going, uh, but you can find more in there to keep you going. And so uh, I, I thought about that, of of how much that has guided my life, of knowing 
when you think there's a wall, you realize that you that the wall is kind of imaginary and you can push through it. And um, I think I've used that in just about every kind of facet of my life. When I went into the military and I went to graduated from Marine Corps or candidate school and how hard that was and, and uh, you know, to snowboarding or, or to work here in the academy where you you meet a lot of gatekeepers. You meet a lot of doors that want to close in front of you. But if you realize, OK, I can find my way around this door, I can find my way around this gatekeeper, um, you know, I can persist and I can I can find another way to go forward. And I think about that rite of passage when, when I was five years old that really taught me all of this of just how much you have inside. And, and no matter what the challenge seems like, um, you can probably figure out a way through it. Yeah, and learning that at such a young age as well. Um, second place, well, that's really amazing. I am not an active person, but um, the meaning that is behind just being able to run and then understanding the capacity that you have in, as an individual and discovering that as a young age. And then I can really see how that ha could inspire and does inspire, you know, the work that you do now and your journey throughout it. Um, thank yeah, you. My brother and I, a year later, a 10K was in Denver. It's like, well, we've already run one. We can run another one. Just my brother and I chose as a first grader and second grader to run the Pepsi 10K in Denver, Colorado as young adults. It's like, why not? We did it before. Let's do it again. You know, so I remember that day of, of, of running the Pepsi 10K in first grade a year later. So it just kind of started my kind of love of running and my deep appreciation of how running is situated within our culture. Yeah, definitely developed a passion choosing to go on another 10K. Um, mm. How is your relationship with your brother? Are you, um, it seems like it would be able to run together. It seems like a. Yeah, my brother and I are very close. We're only 18 months apart. Um, my brother is is massive though. I'm six feet tall, um, which is, you know, average in the United States, but short for my tribe. My brother's six, seven. Um, it's a little more aligned with our tribe <laughs> of being very tall people. Um, and, uh, it, my brother and I, since, you know, we moved around a lot, you know, I went to six different schools in three different states in my K through kind of six journey. Um, so we moved a lot as I had young parents getting jobs and education. Um, and so my brother and I became very close because, you know, we were always just having to go through these kind of big transitions of being new kids at new schools and, uh, finding new friends. And, and so, uh, luckily only being a year and a half apart, you know, we're pretty close in age. So we're able to share a lot of the same interests and passions. So my brother and I remain close to this day. And in fact, you know, we've been highly competitive with each other, you know, sibling rivalry if you're, when you're that close in age, there almost isn't anything we haven't done in life. We haven't turned into a competition, um, and, uh, you know, my brother and I have been playing these kind of crazy little electronic or football games since we were children uh, in the 1970s. It was these little vibrating tables. You put these football figures and they'd move around and, and to these little very simplistic first digital tool kind of games that came out, just like little red lines. That was it. That was on them. Um, and today, my brother and I still play, uh, you know, online, uh, you know, American football games versus each other, um, you know, over the Internet. And so my whole life, my brother and I have been, you know, had, staying connected to each other through through games and through other kind of fun competitions that we like to have with one another yeah that sounds really fun um I don't have any siblings so that sounds really nice that you're able to have someone with you as you grow up especially moving around all those different schools which brings me to the next section actually was to um understand what your experience was like as a first nation um uh throughout your schooling experience and starting over uh starting from your elementary to your high school and what it was like changing so many schools yeah yeah denver was was, was a really good it's still kind of our spiritual home as a family my brother my mother and brother still live there uh, well they returned there after their own kind of career journeys around the world um uh, but we still feel like denver is really our home because it feels most that we know it uh through our childhoods and, and we just have an affinity for it um and uh and, you know, Denver is, is a really important city in the sense that it's a relocation center. And most people don't know kind of relocation centers in U.S. society. But um, after World War II, uh, you know, 96 percent of American Indians lived in Alaska Natives. They lived in, in rural environments. And in the case of American Indians in the lower 48, those are internment camps known as reservations. So in, in Native Americans are imprisoned in an internment camp system, so we can't wage war against the United States. Um, and, uh, and, and so a result of that after in mid 20th century, you know, 96% of indigenous peoples live in rural environments because we are constrained and forced to live in rural environments. The United States wants to get off the hook for its treaty responsibilities to Native Americans. 
in taking away our ability to hunt, fish, and gather in our ancestral territories. You know, we, we lack the ability to get the resources for food, for medicine, for housing. So the United States government's on the hook to provide education, housing, and health services to Indigenous peoples to this day. Um, it's only getting more expensive for the U.S. government because the Native American population keeps growing. And so the United States is trying to find ways to not have to honor these treaty promises. So uh, they came up with one of these programs in, in the 1950s, um, uh, a, re uh, like a voluntary employment relocation program or something was what it's called. But it was really a, a policy designed to deconstruct Native American reservations um, by giving indigenous peoples one-way bus tickets from, from internment camp reservation areas to urban centers, relocation centers. So, uh, you know, we have all these relocation centers in the United States, you know, Chicago, Milwaukee, um, Los Angeles, New York City, uh, Denver, Colorado, Oakland, Seattle. So all these famous relocation centers. So growing up as a child in Denver, there was a huge Native American population in Denver as a relocation center. So there's a lot of kind of uh, urban Native American activity, the Denver March powwow. So uh, at least there was a, a strong Native American presence in the greater Denver area because it was a relocation center. And then my parents were part of, uh, you know, indigenous law school circles. And so, you know, my youth was going to a lot of indigenous law events at the University of Colorado Boulder, University of Denver, or kind of the, the cultural events sponsored by the greater indigenous community of Denver. Um, so I think about that, it, despite it being an urban place, um, it was an incredibly diverse indigenous place as a relocation center. Uh, to give a sense of how diverse relocation centers can be, I've, I've studied, since I work here in Wisconsin, uh, the relocation center of Milwaukee, the city of Milwaukee, and there are more than 14,000 Native Americans living in greater Milwaukee today from over 110 different Native American nations. So you can, can see the diversity of relocation centers where literally indigenous peoples from all over the continent might be deposited into one of these relocation centers. So as a kid, I had just an incredibly youthful, very, very loving, caring mother. Um, and uh, we used to have access to Indigenous events, although, you know, we don't get to participate in the ceremony and kind of cultural traditions of our home community, which is back up in North Dakota or down in the Southwest. Um, but when my mom got her first attorney jobs, her first job was as a, a, in an oil and gas company, and they moved us down to Albuquerque, New Mexico, another kind of Native American mecca of sorts. And um, when we were down there, then we do road trips out to Dineta or uh, the Navajo Reservation, as people know it, Dineta, the land of the people in our language. And my mother would take us to different kind of events and activities happening in Dineta uh, during my kind of uh, uh, latter middle school years. And so I think about, you know, although I grew up as an urban Indian for the most part, uh, my parents did do work like taking us back to the reservation for rite of passage activities or uh, cultural activities. Um, um, so I'm very thankful that uh, I got some exposure um, uh, to, uh, you know, the ways of being of my ancestors in some way, shape, or form, despite being an urban Indian who's lived in kind of large cities throughout my whole childhood. Yeah, could you explain some of the cultural uh, events of the Dinetas? Well, you know, I, I was a little kid, so it's, you know, hard to know exactly what's happening when you're going through this stuff. But, you know, going to these uh, kind of uh, prayer uh, kind of uh, events where, you know, the Navajo world... Uh, you know, we think about how the whole living world is kind of united by a couple different media. Uh, one of them is the atmosphere, the other is water. And so when we think about prayer, uh, the Navajos are trying to, uh, you know, infuse the, the living world with positivity through their prayer. And so you bring the atmosphere into your body and then you release it back out into the atmosphere. So uh, kind of these prayers are really long. They go on like all night long, you know? So uh, getting to witness some of those kind of uh, activities happening um, in, in back in Dineta were really kind of impressed. It left a strong impression for me that people would be so dedicated to their worldview that uh, your whole community would, would organize around ensuring that these prayers were happening and that they were sustained and that the people of the whole community would, you know, uh, provide sustenance for all the participants who are involved in some way, shape, or form. And, and so I was just really thankful to get to witness some of those activities. And then, you know, back on our reservation up north in uh, North Dakota, you know, just getting to be part of community gatherings and community celebrations and community feasts. I'll never forget the first time I saw at, like, at a community gathering, um, you know, there was something buried underground. I didn't understand why they had a tractor. Uh, and they they dug out of the ground, like uh, uh, they'd slow cooked, uh, like, um, a cow underground like overnight 
Um, and so just getting to see them pull this, this cow that had been buried underground and slow cooked on, on hot rocks underground overnight was just a, you know, kind of mind blowing as a young person to think this is a form of cooking, you know, this, and my ancestors did something very similar with bison when they were, you know, back in the day. And so uh, just kind of getting to be parts of activities like that were really meaningful to me. Yeah, and uh, also being able to be around all different kind of cultures and communities um, as you're going from state to state. Um, what would you say that during your education um, was the hardest thing that you've experienced? Um, I think the hardest thing I've ever experienced was high school in Texas. Um, the curriculum itself was the challenge. Texans are, uh, you know, very proud of their kind of settler colonial kind of success. Um, they don't care about the kind of cultural genocide and genocide they enacted. Uh, there are two clear cases of genocide in the United States, uh, Texas and the state and the, and the Republic of California. So Republic of Texas, Republic of California, just go on pure bounty murder to kind of exterminate the indigenous population. Um, and uh, and and so the Texas curriculum, you know, was, is really challenging because it glorifies kind of a settler colonialism and, and uh, those who participated in chattel slavery. Um, most people don't realize like the Alamo in Texas, right? It's a, all the, Davy Crockett and them, he was a Mexican citizen at that time. In order to even live in that region, they had to become Mexican citizens. And so, you know, David Crockett's this Mexican citizen fighting against abolition in Mexico. So abolition comes to the United States of Mexico um, and, uh, and, 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 and they're arguing to keep their slaves. Uh, so the Alamo is about kind of slavers trying to fight against the Mexican government who's promoting abolition. And so most people don't even understand that kind of conundrum of people think of it as the last stand of these important people fighting out the Mexicans. Like, well, that's a Mexicans fighting Mexicans uh, about slavery. And, and the losing side, uh, like in the United States, the Confederacy also loses in Mexico. Um, uh, so, you know, this kind of thing about Texas and then how it portrays itself and thinks of itself. Um, but what made it so hard is that my entire high school, I remember there was two sentences about Native Americans that I read in the entirety of my high school experience. And so, and it was just a really kind of a primitive framing of indigenous peoples in some way. And so I think about just the lack and absence of indigenous peoples within the curriculum of the Texas curriculum that I participated in high school. It's just extraordinarily challenging to see a complete kind of omission of indigenous peoples in some way. Um, and so I, I think about, you know, kind of just the, kind of a slaver history of, of South, uh, you know, South Southern Texas. I went to high school just outside of Houston, Texas, a famous sugar plantation economy, chattel slavery, a kind of a functioning of how that economy really worked. And, and just the attitudes and beliefs that people still had when I was in high school in the 1980s of, of just how, you know, African Americans were subhuman in some way, shape or form. And, um, you know, the kind of bigotry that was incredibly present and visible throughout my high school community or the university uh, or the, the high school kind of leadership and the high school student body, you know, openly used racist language like the N-word all the time and didn't seem to have a problem with it at all. And so I think about, you know, high school and how challenging that was just to get through that curriculum where, you know, kind of glorifies white supremacy. And and, um, and so it, it actually motivated me. I was like, there's no way I'm going to high school in Texas for, or I'm sorry, there's no way I'm going to college in Texas for any reason whatsoever. So I had to be the best student possible so I can get out of high school, get out of Texas to go to college somewhere else. And so I think that that's why it was so hard. It motivated me to say, well, I don't want to keep studying here. This is, this is the type of education they're providing. It's not the education that I want. And so I'm going to have to prepare myself to be competitive to get into education elsewhere. And I'm really thankful because it just motivated me to get out of Texas. And uh, I'm, I'm happy that um, I was able to go to college outside of Texas. Yeah, I, I love how that you're able to take such a negative experience and then find a way to positively get out of it and um, be able to pursue and use it as an inspiration to you know, get out of that environment. Um, what are some ways that you think that schools can kind of stop pushing a whitewashed version of history and a more like authentic representation? Yeah, well, it's really interesting. Now that I work in higher education, I've worked in universities for 23 years, I kind of see how kind of the, the, the forefront of research happens. So I mean, I've been part of these Research One universities, the high capacity research, University of Washington, Seattle, where I did my undergraduate degree. And now I've worked at this Research One university, the University of Wisconsin-Madison for a long time. And so, you know, I've had privy to watching a bunch of historians in particular write these amazing histories um, you know, Professor Ned Blackhawk, he's now at Yale University, has written some influential American history documents. Uh, Susan Johnson, Richard White, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think of these great historians, Bill Cronin, William Cronin, 
um, Steve Kantowitz. And so all these, right, they're making these histories that have come out in the last you know, decade or so, but it takes like 20 years for that contemporary research to trickle itself down into kind of textbooks or kind of books for high school students in some way. So it, it takes like a generation for the kind of currently research to make its way to these publications that are in kind of, um, you know, high school textbooks. And, and, and the textbook racket is a real conundrum as well. Um, you know, uh, who produces textbooks, what they're willing to include within them. Um, they're obviously going to hew to a very settler colonialist perspective because they need to sell these textbooks to many states around the United States, many school districts in many states. And so if it's, it's if perceived as being like a too woke of a curriculum or something, it might be rejected somewhere else. And so unfortunately, textbooks for high school students, you know, hew to a highly settler colonialist perspective because of simply the market economy of capitalism and who will buy those textbooks. Um, and so they have to kind of shape them to be uh, as, 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 you know, as, as least critical of, of settler colonialism as possible uh, in order for that textbook to be widely sold across the United States. That's interesting how colonialism and capitalism are so deeply intertwined like that. Um, speaking, you did speak to uh, your place within uh, within higher education as um, like working there, but what was your experience uh, as a student in higher education? As a student, uh, I, it, my first experience is I did attend the United States Naval Academy and Military College for four years. And so um, very different education than anybody else receives. Our education is designing us to be kind of managers of a, of a pretty unruly kind of population. And so go, what are the skills we need to be highly effective human managers? Um, we also have to understand, um, you know, the complex uh, theoretical um, foundations of, of how complex machinery and aeronautics and avionics and and kind of a um, you know, weapon systems function. So I got like a, a kind of inter, a interdisciplinary kind of engineering and, and science degree from the United uh, work or science background. Um, but that was a little different kind of education. But I, I transferred and I finished my degree at the University of Washington, Seattle. And, and that was that was revelatory for me. Like, you know, because instead of just studying, you know, thermodynamics and kinematics and, and uh, kind of just hardcore science, um, to understand how like a nuclear engine would function on a, on a, on a sailing ship. Um, you know, I, it's kind of thinking of, of how uh, suddenly I, I was exposed to indigenous and American Indian studies and a vibrant Native American college community and indigenous scholars and indigenous speakers. You know, I, Wilma Mankiller came and spoke at the University of Washington, Seattle. And so, um, you know, I would never have that kind of exposure if I'd purely stayed in my entire undergraduate career at the United States Naval Academy. I would have never really gotten to taste what indigenous scholarship was all about. And so for me, it was just uh, a, one of the most, you know, nourishing experiences I've ever had at the University of Washington, Seattle, uh, because of how they supported the indigenous campus community there, um, how they had the Burke Museum on campus there that had a lot of Northwest coastal indigenous uh, kind of uh, culture represented in that museum. And, and then just, uh, just the vibrant, uh, tribes of the Pacific Northwest. And so, um, you know, I think, you know, it really illuminated to me how indigenous scholarship can can function. And uh, I wouldn't have been privy to that if I'd only stayed at the United States Naval Academy. Yeah, it sounds like it was a wonderful community. Um, were there any teachers at that university that um, inspired you in any way? Or was uh, yes. Yeah, some of the faculty, uh, you know, one of the faculty I really liked, um, was the I can't remember his name right now. Uh, it's been a long time, but he was the chair of this interesting, interesting uh, uh, kind of it was certificate program. It was called the Comparative History of Ideas at the time, CHID. And um, I had to still take a few uh, kind of uh, literature, you know, social science and literature electives. Um, Naval Academy, we didn't have a lot of that focus, and so I had to take a little bit more when I transferred to the uh, state university and. And so I, as a science major, as a, as a physical oceanography major, which is kind of math and physics, physics combined. So, you know, I had taken the minimum amount of literature and social science humanly possible up to that point. And I was still not a strong writer. So I just didn't want, I wanted to avoid having to write a lot of things. I could do equations all day long, but I didn't really like writing kind of papers per se. And um, so the comparative history ideas was this kind of middle point where they kind of bring science to the humanities in some way. And so I'd found that program because it was my way to get these requirements that I needed to do, but in the most sciencey way possible was what I was trying to do. Um, little did I know that, you know, the critical thinking that they would illuminate to me in that program um, was just 
revelatory. And so uh, I really enjoyed the chair of the program. I'd taken this one course with him and and um, he just wanted us to understand kind of how um, value systems operate and the relationship to governance and the relationship to religion and the relationship to kind of capitalism. And, and so these really big ideas, kind of grappling with big ideas. And, and so um, as a systems thinker already is physical oceanography, we're trying to map out currents and atmospheric oceanic interactions. I'm already, a, I'm already a systems thinker at heart. And then here's system thinking, but in a social science context. And, and so I really appreciated um, those courses because I, I took a couple of them and, and uh, just I'm, I'm better for it. Um, um, similarly, I had a, I met a, a girlfriend when I was out there and, and she was a history women's studies double major. And she gave me the greatest ultimatum ever. She's like, take two women's studies course or this relationship is over. And so uh, I ended up taking two women's studies courses as well. The psychobiology of women and then another one. And, um, uh, you know, one was a science course, a science E course. So I like that too. And, and I, those are just the, the, me just being in the discussion sections alone, just coming out of the military, a military uh, educational environment to that. Um, those, those uh, you know, I infuriated my discussion section. I was the only male in my whole section. And so, uh, you know, I'd say stupid things and they'd correct me very readily, my, my peers in my discussion section. So uh, I think about, you know, my peers alone in the women's studies course that I took and as the only guy in my section, I think there's only a handful of us men who took the course itself. Um, and uh, I think about how much education I received in that as well. So my, my peers in many sense, the women the undergraduates uh, were more my teachers in that sense, more so than the faculty members. Yeah, higher education presents so many opportunities. And just as a first year, I'm excited for all the upcoming years and what I would be like, what I can participate in. And that, that is an amazing ultimate. Um, I'm glad yeah, you came well, out. Of I really, I really did care about my partner and, and they wanted me to grow. And I was like, okay, you know, and I'm really thankful I took those courses. You know, I, I come from two different, uh, actually three different matrilineal societies. So I thought that I was progressive and kind of understood things as a person from matrilineal indigenous societies, um, but to kind of have more formally study the power structures of the United States and how a capitalist patriarchy limits the opportunities for women within U.S. society was a really important uh, course for me to take. And so, you know, because and I can contrast it today to being part of matrilineal societies where women have much significant roles in our cultures that they do even in the United States today. And so, I, you know, uh, Vine Deloria in, in his book, Custer Died for Your Sin, said, you know, we brought the white man a long ways in 500 years. And so I, I think about how indigenous societies and our many different value systems have, have educated the United States along the way toward hopefully greater gender equality or uh, equality between men and women as our natural legal societies kind of embody this a long time ago. Yeah, education is so important for gaining new perspectives and viewing the world in different ways. Um, it really helps us understand not only ourselves, but the people around us on new levels, which, uh, yeah, I mean, that and you know you're working in education as well i'm curious as to how that happened what was the what what got you into uw madison what did you why did you move from washington well it's like like everybody it's the networks you make in higher education in college that are going to serve you well you know a lot of times we'll move away or grow apart from the friends we had in high school um but a lot of times if you have the great fortune that everybody gets to go to higher education to four-year institutions but if you do go to a residential based four-year institution the people you meet there will be likely your lifelong friends. And um, I had the good fortune of meeting a graduate student named Ned Blackhawk at the University of Washington, Seattle, as he was working on his dissertation in history. Uh, he came and lectured in one of the comparative history of idea courses that I mentioned. Um, and so uh, he he was a guest lecturer and I was like, oh, a young indigenous scholar. I'm going to go get to know this person, you know. And um, and I had then worked uh, for the Native American Science Outreach Network based out of the University of Washington, Seattle. And it was taking reservation youth from the Native nations of, of the Washington state and uh, trying to get them into thinking of, of STEM as possible kind of educational pathways from science, technology, engineering, mathematics majors. Uh, since I was a science major myself, you know, I could explain to them, you know, why I was involved studying what I was studying, why I thought it was meaningful to study what I was studying. Uh, so the Native American Science Outreach Network had me working with uh, kind of high school youth from uh, the tribes of the state of Washington today. And... And so uh, this guy, Ned Blackhawk, got hired uh, when he finished his dissertation at the University of Wisconsin-Madison as the new history professor with a specialization in Western history. And, and he remembered me and the work that I was doing at Native American Science Outreach Network. And so he encouraged me to apply 
uh, to a position at the University of Wisconsin, Washington, uh, University of Wisconsin Madison. And so that's how I came to Wisconsin is that uh, because of the networks we build in higher education through times of our own study, through times of employment, through alumni networks, all the powerful networks that higher education can help establish, you know, benefited me as well, where, uh, you know, the person remembered me and said, you should apply for this position. And lo and behold, I did. And I was hired uh, in, in March of you know 2000. Uh, I came to the University of uh, Wisconsin Madison. Yeah, and all the connections that we meet and the people we talk to lead us to this very moment. So and I'm grateful that happened too, because now I have the opportunity to be able to hear your story and talk to you and um, understand all of this. Um, I, as your, so what was your initial role? I know you're the director of travel relations. Um, I was aware that you were the assistant dean um, as well. What was that like, those roles? Um, yeah, the, the assistant dean role uh, was interesting. I started in the School of Education uh, in a unit uh, designed to support the needs of underrepresented students in higher education. So we are called the Office of Undergraduate Recruitment and Retention. And so we're su supporting historically under uh, underrepresented communities within the School of Education. Um, it was a lot of fun doing that work. I, I then also took on a job, uh, the American Indian Curriculum Services Coordinator in the School of Education at UW-Madison. So there's a state law, a state statutes uh, from 1989, 1991 that uh, stipulate that the history, culture, and tribal sovereignty of the Native nations of Wisconsin must be instructed at least twice in elementary and at least once in high school. And so we had to prepare our, our future teachers to be able to uh, do that educational mandate. And so, you know, I, would, I was part of my role in American Indian Curriculum Services to work with our pre-service teachers to help them think about how they're going to teach the history, culture, and tribal sovereignty of the Native Nations of Wisconsin. Um, so, you know, I had that from the undergraduate recruitment retention role to the American Indian Curriculum Services role. Um, and then uh, I started helping with the Education Graduate Research Scholars Program as well, supporting that program. And so when uh, my boss uh, left the institution, they asked me to serve in the interim leadership role since I was familiar with several of the programs. Um, and then uh, when it came time to hire that role, I was hired permanently into that role um, where I supervised five programs, you know, a, a program serving graduate students, uh, so pre-college program for high school students, and then uh, a couple programs for undergraduate students. Um, and so I really thankful for that opportunity. Um, the School of Education is a, one of the highly, highly ranked schools of education in the United States. Rankings are problematic for many reasons, but um, when people are at the top, they like to remind people they're at the top. And um, School of Education, incredibly highly re regarded public uh, you know, uh, university uh, school of education. And so the standards are very high there. And so the, the, you know, the demands for productivity and excellence are very high. And so I really enjoyed knowing that, you know, our, our, our school was deeply committed to excellence and everything that we did, and that we needed to hold ourselves to the highest standard possible in scholarship and practice. And so it just really asked me to up my game and, and seriously think about, well, how do you help in, in other people sustain excellence as well? Because, you know, I had to supervise people in that role. And so how do I bring the most and best out of my colleagues uh, so that we can sustain excellence within the school and, and also, you know, fulfill our own creative and professional needs as, as professionals individually? Um, so I think about, I'm really thankful for that opportunity, but it was, it was pressure. It was really hard because knowing just how excellent the faculty were all around us and the graduate students and the aspiring students, um, just to make sure that we maintained uh, the, the highest quality we could in all the programmatic offerings we did. So I'm really thankful for that opportunity. Um, I remember working, I worked so hard during that period of time because there's so much administration you have to do for five different programs. And I'd be working a lot of late hours and I'd be writing reports like 2 a.m. at work. And, and just, you know, it asked a lot of me to grow as a professional. Uh, it was one of the biggest leaps I've ever done in terms of, okay, this, I now have to learn a whole new set of kind of administrative skills to keep going forward. Um, and I had to learn them on the job. And so it was just a, a lot of late hours for me to figure that out. Yeah, and I heard, you know, in addition to all of that as well, you were doing cultural landscape tours at UW-Madison. Can you tell me a little bit about, uh, like, around the timeline that was and uh, what those consisted of? Sure. Uh, you know, I, I was hired in the year 2000 as the American Indian Student Academic Services Coordinator, so supporting the needs of the American Indian Alaska Native Native Hawaiian students on campus. Um, and I realized that we had a very special place as, as an institution, an important indigenous cultural center of De Jope, uh, Four Lakes in the Ho-Chunk language. And, you know, it just wasn't acknowledged publicly by the institution, the incredible importance of the cultural center of where the university is now located. And, uh, and so 
uh, I was fortunate to work with Ada Deer, who's considered one of the most important indigenous intellectuals of the 20th century. Um, you know, Ada Deer, just incredible person. And she was the chair and director of American Indian Studies at the time. And, and she and I revitalized a course sequence called American Indian Studies 150 and 151 um, to help kind of support the retention and graduation needs of Native American students on campus. And as part of that course, uh, Ada had invited a gentleman named Daniel Einstein in, and he gave us a, 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 took us to two locations. He took us to the Black Hawk marker that was created by the class of 1888 on campus. And then he took us to the uh, effigy mounds of Observatory Hill and explained to us, you know, what was on campus. And Daniel's role, he was a cultural resource manager for facilities planning and management. So he understood the indigenous landscape very well of this campus because it was part of his job to make sure that we were stewarding uh, co some components that fall under state law or federal law, like the Indian Mounds Protection Act of 1985 in Wisconsin, or things that had to engage the Native American Graves Protect and Repatriation Act of federal law. Um, and so he, he understood the inventory of indigenous kind of features of our campus. And uh, in working with him, we developed the First Nations Cultural Landscape Tour as a retention tool for Native American students. And so we began that in 2003. And uh, when I went to the work in the School of Education, it became apparent that our teacher education students would benefit from this because they had to fulfill that Act 31 mandate to teach history, culture, and tribal sovereignty of the Native Nations of Wisconsin. So then I started giving it to a lot of teacher education students and teacher education graduate students. And uh, then faculty got wind of it, and then faculty wanted it, and then uh, other departments wanted it. And so it kind of snowballed and grew from a small intervention to help Native American students see themselves with our institution to a broad professional development activity that's reached you know, thousands and thousands of people at this point. So I'm um, just really thankful that people see the value of understanding this place um, beyond just the colonial veneer, that kind of thin layer of European and European American kind of development on this land uh, to pull that veneer back and see the full 12,000 year history of this space is a kind of enriching educational activity that has really helped a lot of faculty in their courses uh, or students in their own career trajectories in some way, shape or form. So I'm thankful that I got to give it to uh, Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes. I got to give the tour to His Holiness of Karmapa, one of the important leaders in, in Buddhist worldview. Um, I think of all these really influential folks who've come through campus and have sought out this particular educational experience because it's benefit in kind of breaking through the colonial veneer to see the kind of full human story of, of any place. And in this case, you know, this really uh, important cultural center of indigenous peoples that uh, the Ho-Chunk now called De Jop. Is the way that all the communities have come together to be able to, you know, understand the land that we're on as a uh, as learning community, as a faculty, I mean, people outside of the UW Madison community. Um, uh, I wish that I could have had the chance to be able to attend one of those tours. Um, it sounded like a wonderful opportunity to learn and understand at a deeper level of the history and where we are now. Um, yeah, the tours will be still going on. My colleague Omar Polar. He's Mo Lake Sakaga in Ojibwe. Um, he's the Indigenous Education Coordinator in the Office of the Provost here at UW Madison. And so Omar Polar now leads those tours. And, and we're trying to develop a tour program, a First Nations Cultural Landscape Tour program where we hire and train other people. Because, um, you know, Omar and myself, there's usually only been two tour providers at any given time for the First Nations Cultural Landscape Tour, which kind of limits how many tours we can provide. Uh, and it'll be down to like uh, Omar and a couple other people. Now we've trained up another staff member. Uh, we're training up a couple students to be able to provide these tours to meet the demand uh, that's out there. And so it won't be going away. It's, it's just will change hands into more appropriate hands, you know, because I always remind people that me as a Plains and Southwest uh, person um, giving a tour of the Great Lakes is, you know, the cultural and literal equivalent of a person from Barcelona, Spain, giving you a tour of ancient Rome, right? So it's, it's a thousand miles away, different language, different culture. Um, these aren't really my stories to tell necessarily. You know, uh, it's not, I don't want to represent culture poorly. And so having uh, these tour in the hands of the indigenous people of the Great Lakes is much more important because they can bring their culture and histories to bear on the tour itself. Yeah, and once this uh, pu uh, podcast is published, I'll be make sure to be able to link the information on the uh, landscape tours. I'm going to check it out myself as well and just have give it an opportunity for people who may have not heard about it before to be able to attend those. Um, and it's really great that a program is being um, in the process of cultivated. I think that is a great way to help that grow. 
Um, I also heard that you were part of the uh, Our Shared Future PAC, um, which recognizes the land as well. Could you tell me a little bit about that process and how uh, you were involved in that in the process? Sure. Uh, it, you know, the, they'd asked me uh, to make a series of signage on campus um, be, because it might help other groups kind of have a self-guided tour of campus. In particular, we're thinking of like uh, K-12 groups, fourth graders in particular. It's when we teach Wisconsin history, so it's often the first time we'll teach American Indian history and culture in the curriculum. And so uh, since I've been giving these place-based tours in working through the teacher education program, I started giving up to fourth grade classes uh, for my, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, pre-service teachers, the ones who are doing their kind of teaching practicums. Um, you know, they want to bring their students for this type of experience. And so um, we thought maybe we could make a series of signs on campus so, you know, groups of educators could bring their students on self-guided tours by going sign to sign to sign. Um, uh, so, you know, the Committee on Native American Campus Signage was formed to, to, to answer that kind of dilemma. And, and then coordinating with the Ho-Chunk Nation, you know, we found out that they didn't really prefer signs that much on campus, you know, uh, particularly around important cultural sites of theirs, because they talked about how their culture and their sites were, were meant to blend into the environment and how signs are meant to stand out from the environment. So we didn't go on the full kind of signage pathway, uh, but we did make one sign where it made sense, where a sign would make sense. And that was the Our Shared Future Heritage Marker. And um, there is a series of heritage markers on Bascom Hill. There's actually about 20 of them. So this is just one of 20. You'll see the same format and shape of all the signs. They all come in the same exact shape and form. Um, and they're just scattered around Bascom Hill, acknowledging kind of different kind of parts of university history. Um, and so we thought it was really important to kind of be responsive also to a 2016 Associated Students of Madison resolution. So in 2016, the Associated Students of Madison, one of our shared governance bodies of the university, passed a resolution asking for three things. They asked for the university to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day. And thankfully this year in, in 2022, I helped raise the Ho-Chunk Nation flag in front of Bascom Hall on Indigenous Peoples Day. So we're doing that activity. Um, the students also asked for the, uh, the flags of the 12 Native Nations of Wisconsin to be displayed prominently. On uh, November 4th of this year, we just received those flags. They'll be installed in the law school in the spring 2023 semester. And then uh, the third thing they asked for is they wanted a plaque interrogating President Lincoln in his role of in the Dakota 38, the largest mass execution in U.S. history, where 38 Indigenous people were simultaneously hung on a square gallows in Mankato, Minnesota in December 1862. And they also wanted uh, Lincoln's role in the land grants, how uh, land grant universities function, they function off of the dispossessed lands of indigenous peoples. So where does that land come from that funds land grants? Nobody asked that question. They just assumed land was always there, but it's not true. Uh, where does the uh, federal government get surplus land to bequeath to state governments for the purpose of higher education? Well, they get it from dispossessed indigenous lands. And so um, the student government wanted a plaque interrogating Lincoln's role in the Dakota 38 and his role with land grant institutions. Um, so that was that 2016 Associated Students of Madison resolution. So they'd asked for that. We thought instead of writing a plaque about uh, a conflict that is several hundred miles from here in another state today, um, maybe we could tell, talk about the history of this place itself and not the history of, say, the class of 1888 markers really about the ethnic cleansing of Illinois. You know, the 1862 uh, real, uh, Dakota 38 tragedy was about the dispossession of, of indigenous peoples in kind of Minnesota territory or Minnesota at the time. And, and so instead of talking about other state histories, maybe we could we talk about ours. So we pivoted and, and we wrote the Our Shared Future Heritage Marker in partnership with the Ho-Chunk Nation. And so we had like 10 drafts of it. Um, we'd send it to the Ho-Chunk. They'd say, that's too not enough. We send it to the university lawyers. They'd say, we can't say that because we'll get sued. And so we had to kind of find this middle ground of language um, that was acceptable both to the Ho-Chunk and to the university community. So a collaborative process where uh, several of us all kind of chipped away at trying to figure out what kind of educational message would would, would be coherent and make sense uh, to inform our campus community about the kind of complex shared history of this place. And that kind of informs the shared future we have. Because we as Indigenous people say you can't have reconciliation without truth first. 
So truth must uh, kind of precede reconciliation activity in some way. And so the R shared future heritage marker starts putting some of that truth out there about violence back treaties and how the Ho-Chunk were forced to leave this area and how ethnic cleansing was the process employed to try to remove the Ho-Chunk from this area that failed because the Ho-Chunk are too tough, too savvy, too smart, too sophisticated to be removed from their ancestral homeland. And so we wanted to share a little bit about that kind of complexity that would move us toward reconciliation as an institution. So we need that truth first before we can kind of do true acts of reconciliation in some way. Yeah, and it sounds like a, a a huge process, but it definitely has built the background for reconciliation and just being able to be a part of that. Um, it's really, really, really cool. Um, I know speaking in like present time right now, the one of the things that are coming in pushing the truth is the uh, sifting and reckoning exhibition at the Chasm Museum. I was wondering what your thoughts about uh, about what your thoughts were about that and if you have any other ideas on how students and the University of Madison can kind of find ways to continue pushing truth uh, in order to build more reconciliation. Yeah, I was really excited. I, get, I was part of the initial study group that Chancellor Blank uh, had uh, assigned to think about uh, our, our shared kind of our, or the experiences of underrepresented students in the early 20th century at UW Madison, you know, because I've done a lot of history on Native American student enrollment, you know, where we didn't have our first Native American graduate until, uh, you know, 19, um, what, uh, 46, I think Geraldine Harvey graduated in 1946 or 1953, one of the two, I can't remember the date exactly, but it was after World War II, we have our first Native American graduates from the university. We had our first Native American students in 1903 and 1904, uh, Milton Bain and Thomas St. Germain, who were both recruited to play a football team. Because um, uh, in 1896, the University of Wisconsin-Madison played the Carlisle Indian Boarding School football team in Chicago, and Wisconsin lost to Carlisle Indian Boarding School, shockingly, in 1896. And lo and behold, our first Native American students are football recruits a few years later. Um, so I've done some history on kind of Native American student experiences and, and the First Nations cultural landscape tour really examined that as well. And so I was asked to be part of the initial study group that ended up kind of creating and, and hiring the director of the public history project and Casey Butcher. So I was really fortunate to get to work with the lead faculty, Steve Kantowitz and Christine Clark Fajara on the initial study group that kind of kind of afforded the idea of the, the sifting and reckoning or the art, the um, uh, public history project itself. And so, uh, you know, with the history, the, the work that I've done closely with Professor Kantowitz in the history department by providing kind of First Nation cultural landscape tours to his history courses influenced him quite a bit. He ended up doing a Ho-Chunk history course. He has a, a book on the Ho-Chunk history coming out this spring. And so it really kind of shaped his kind of educational trajectory as, in, as a historian to really understand this place deeply and the history of the indigenous peoples of this place. And so I'm really happy that Professor Kantowitz and Professor Clark Pajara uh, you know, kept Indigenous peoples in mind in the Sifting and Reckoning exhibit after the director, Casey Butcher, was hired to lead the project for a few years. Um, and so I'm so excited that they've kind of included the kind of ways that we kind of inadvertently uh, created a really hostile environment to Indigenous peoples up until the 1940s in particular, um, but through the Pipe of Peace activity, how students uh, kind of represented Indigenous peoples in demeaning ways uh, during that, and how that influenced the, the design of the Memorial Union itself and the paintings and images of Indigenous people you'll find in the Memorial Union. Um, and so it just kind of reminds me of kind of very simplified ideas that U.S. citizens had of Indigenous peoples in the early 20th century and how they enacted those kind of really demeaning representations of Native Americans within the student body. And so I'm happy that the, the Public History Project includes that component within it to remind us the uh, Here's how we've educated students to understand Native Americans, and re they're reflecting their understanding of Native Americans back to us through activities like the Pipe of Peace or through activities like the minstrel shows that uh, students used to hold in Great Hall. And so I think it's just really powerful to recognize how white supremacy functions. And although we're a state in the North and like to think that we're not a slave state, so we're progressive in some way, um, you know, the the public history project and the sifting and reckoning exhibit that associated with it really illuminate how white supremacy functions in the North and in non-slave states and, and how this place was really hostile toward people of color uh, for most of the kind of uh, 20th century. And it's only kind of in the latter parts of the 20th century that we start working toward greater inclusion and tolerance as a community. Yeah, um, I, I, um, 
being part of the student government, Associate Students in Madison, we had the opportunity to be able to meet with Casey, the director of the um, Something and Reckoning exhibit, and uh, just both of them, um, both of the directors. And we, it was really, really interesting hearing all the research and the work that was put into it and gathering all of these stories. And um, I know that the Something and Reckoning exhibit was a huge um, inspiration as well for my podcast and just understanding the importance of stories and the importance of how they make us who we are and how they fit into the social, uh, the larger social contexts. Um, and there was one last thing that I wanted to ask you about is that uh, the term of culture humility, I remember hearing you say that in um, a video I was watching of you and I just, I, I would love if you could kind of explain uh, what that is more and how UW-Madison can really partake in it and how students and you know, people around the world can partake in what's called cultural humility. Yeah, I really thank my my colleague Omar Polar for really kind of illuminating cultural humility as an important kind of framework for the how we approach our work in higher education. Um, and cultural humility is pretty simple. It's like, can you acquire your own culture to learn and appreciate from another's culture, right? Can, can you, can you, because the United States likes, I think there's a term exceptionalism that we like to throw around as a U.S. society, that the U.S. is, you know, has a U.S., United States exceptionalism, like we're this first kind of experimental kind of government of people ruling themselves, you know, the the, the founding of this country kind of, kind of came out of the dis, dis, um, the dissatisfaction with monarchy as a form of rule. And so people rejected monarchy and created a democracy here in the United States. Uh, so it's a, it's a novel experiment. Uh, it's a novel settler colonial experiment. It's still a settler colonial enterprise, um, but it, it's one that's trying to kind of have a, a different kind of representation of people. So in, in creating kind of one of the kind of well-situated democracies of the world, uh, we like to think of ourselves as exceptional in some way. So the United States exceptionalism, right? We've created this form of government that's an economically competitive form of government. It's uh, been able to sustain itself for uh, uh, less than 300 years so far, but it's still kind of going strong in terms of some political, uh, political and economic might uh, that it, it has within the context of the greater global world. And so there's a lot of kind of pride in, in the kind of uh, values and kind of uh, you know, governmental and economic structures of what is now the United States. Um, but, you know, if, if we just champion that, you know, we would kind of ignore the kind of lessons and, and knowledge we can learn from other cultures. So clearly capitalist patriarchy has its limits. See the degradation of the planet. You know, if we kept falling down this pathway, we might, no one could live here potentially healthily. Um, so it's clearly not a sustainable kind of uh, economic or a kind of governance model that has led us to the destruction of the planet itself. Um, so indigenous peoples have incredible knowledge in how to coexist with the living world around them. Um, the indigenous peoples of the Great Lakes have compacts with nature. Um, they view land as the first teacher in the living world around us as teachers and relatives. Uh, in Diné, or Diné Bazad, the language of my ancestors, the Diné, uh, we call the trees the standing people in translation. So kind of affording them agency and spirit in some way, the trees themselves. So if we think about the living world, and if we tried to steward the living world, that that every other living being had the same quality of life that we as human beings enjoyed, you know, that's the kind of philosophy and approach of, of indigenous nations of the Great Lakes. And so they're just some of the world's greatest environmentalists. They have um, some of the greatest knowledge in sustainable forestry and how to engage the living world around them to, to not uh, unbalance the ecosystems that sustain culturally important beings like wild rice or walleye or deer or these other animals that are important to them and, and living beings like, like wild rice. Um, so I think, you know, cultural humility is like, okay, so maybe patriarchal capitalism isn't the end-all be-all. You know, maybe we can quiet that perspective and learn from the viewpoints of others who've lived here for exponentially longer. You know, Menominee have lived here for at least 10,000 plus years. They know what's up here in the Great Lakes, right? Maybe we could quiet our understanding instead of like the U.S. we know best, you know, our science, our educational institutions are envy of the world. Clearly, we're super smart, um, you know. Everybody should listen to us because we know best. And that's not the truth. That's not the case. You know, the United States doesn't know best in all cases. And so it's important to recognize, you know, when you can quiet your own culture to learn from the culture of others. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, just all of the information that you shared your, about your story, the experiences that you've been through, um, your childhood, education, and the work that you're doing. Um, as we reach the wrap-up section of this interview, I was just, this is a very broad question, but I feel it's important. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, what makes you you? What are the passions and the things in your life that give you the most uh, meaning that, yeah, that gives you the most meaning? You know, well, I've, you know, I've always liked challenge. 
right? I've always liked to challenge myself. You know, I think I learned that from that that run, you know, when I was in five years old. Like, you know, there's a lot you can do if you just try and work hard, you know? It's not going to be comfortable. It's it's not going to be easy. You know, it wasn't meant to be. It, it, it was meant to be hard. It was meant to be a struggle. And it's meant to kind of ask you to dig deep within yourself to try to go forward. And so I think about all the things I've tried in life where I became a really, a pretty decent runner, not college quality runner, but a, a good high school runner. Like I, I could run a 5K in like 1647, you know, I could, I could run pretty fast. Um, yeah, you know, I could run like a 454 mile, so a sub five mile, but you know, to be competitive in college, you could be like a 414 mile. So, I mean, that's a long ways off from being college competitive, but it's still fast for high school. Um, so I challenged myself to become a good runner. I ran a marathon, you know, in college and I was supposed to run it in high school, but I got the flu right before it. So I had to delay until I was in college to run my marathon. And, and so I've always just like challenged myself. I went to Outward Bound in high school, a really kind of rigorous Alpine mountaineering program because I just wanted the challenge and experience. Uh, when I was in the Navy, I got to be called part of the command seamanship training seminar where I lived on a boat for a summer and we sailed way out in the Atlantic Ocean. And that was really hard with a crew of nine to sail 24 hours a day. And and so I've always just sought challenge. And, and so even in my professional work, you know, always seeking to push myself hard and learn more and grow more. You know, I mentioned how hard that assistant dean position really was uh, to try to grow as a professional in that role and learn how, how to be effective as a supervisor and as a kind of administrator of multiple programs. And then, you know, the great challenge of, of trying to carve out a new tribal relations role on campus and, and hopefully have that function in a healthy and, and, and impactful way. So for me, you know, I think the one thing that's held true is like I've always liked to challenge myself. Um, and, and whether it be snowboarding, you know, I, I love snowboarding. So I, I ended up moving to a ski resort for three years to get really good at snowboarding. And so, you know, when I really love something, uh, you know, I really try to get understand it and know it well and participate it. And, and, and right before we kind of started this interview, we were just kind of chit chatting and and the World Cup is happening today, you know, the 2022 World Cup. And, and uh, you know, I think about the things that I love so much and, and I, the challenge that I enjoy just kind of inexperience and, you know, I've, you know, I've traveled to, you know, four different countries to see the World Cup, you know, just itself, just because yeah, it's challenging to, to, to get yourself organized enough to go travel to these places and then go meet interesting people. And, and so I just think, you know, the one throughput that's existed through my life is that, you know, I really like to challenge myself. But I also, I've also tried to carve out positions and that I've, I've always jokingly called myself a free range chicken. Um, <laughs> that, you know, I get to get to go and do the things that I think are important to do, right? I don't have bosses telling me you have to do X, Y, and Z in order A, B, and C. They've just become, we hired you, Aaron, because you have capacities. Go do the work. You know the goals of the work, you know, in, improve Native American student retention, uh, improve graduation, improve, you know, how teacher education students do their work. Or And so I've always thought, well, now I can bring this creativity um, in, into this work. Well, what, what solutions will work? You know, what are kind of systems based solutions that will make this situation kind of uh, have a better outcome in some way, shape or form. So, you know, I like to challenge myself. I like a lot of autonomy, being a free range chicken to apply the skills and talents that I have to the kind of areas of work that I've been hired to do. And so I've just been really fortunate that I've been a free range chicken for almost 23 years on campus where I've just got to be the person I want to be and do the things that I want to do. Um, but all of them align with my values and interests, you know, I'm making sure that more underrepresented people succeed in the field of education, making sure indigenous people succeed in the field of in, in, in higher education uh, and, and making sure that land grant institutions are held accountable for their past actions and try to make those relations right with the Native, Native American nations they've harmed in some way. Yeah, and challenges give us, um, enables us for so much growth and uh, seeing how it's played into all of the places in your life um, as a director, as the um, dean, as the things that you're doing here for students on campus. And um, it's just challenges can, although they are difficult in the moment, they really have so much benefit and give so much strength. And um, I definitely want to keep challenging myself and just hearing your story has been I've learned so much about um, First Nations and I've learned so much about the history and so much about uh, UW-Madison and who you are and your story. So um, mm -hmm. thank you for that. And the last thing I wanna ask you is if you have any uh, messages that you would like to say to any First Nations that may be listening. Yeah, just uh, sustain the joy in your life. You know, you know, there's a lot of injustice and a lot of wrongs we still need to correct. Um, Native Americans lead all these negative kind of outcomes in kind of health 
uh, cancer, heart disease, suicide. So, you know, there's, it's not, it's still not easy. You know, it, it, the challenges in front of indigenous country are, are profound and require a work of many people working together and supporting one another to do that work. But we can't lose sight of the joy in the world that we should do the things that bring us joy. You know, some people that's dancing and singing and drumming. Other people, it's, you know, they love science fiction. Other people, they love art. You know, they love travel. So we still have to nourish our spirits and um, and do the things that bring us joy. And one of the elders that, uh, you know, I've worked with in my role on campus over the last 20 years said something really profound to me when I started working here 20-something uh, years ago. They just said, Aaron, we didn't work so hard for your generation to look at your feet. You know, when you walk around, walk around with your chin up. Because we did the work so that you could, we'd be in these spaces and that we can walk around with our chins up. So don't just look at your feet, you know, look around with your head, with your chin held high, you know, so reminding us, you know, although, you know, people might not always be tolerant of others and, and people might try to create uh, environments that aren't welcoming to others, you know, we should recognize our ancestors worked so hard to create the governments that we have today, that the privileges we enjoy as first-class citizens that were only granted in 1968 and, you know, all these other laws like the, you know, Indian Child Welfare Act, the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, Native American Grace Protection and Repatriation Act, Native American Languages Act, you know, these don't happen randomly. They happen because a lot of determined people wanted to ensure that we had the social space to be the indigenous peoples we wanted to be. Um, I think a lot of people kind of summarize it as like, we are our ancestors' wildest dreams. Like, you know, we still have our tribal sovereignty. We're trying to re reclaim our languages and cultures and sustain our life ways um, in, in ways that maybe people couldn't have imagined 100 years ago. And so, you know, part of that is uh, part of that of being, uh, you know, our ancestors' wildest dreams is also living lives of joy and happiness. And so despite all the complex challenges that come with a settler colonial society and the ongoing kind of outcomes of colonialism itself, um, we can still find the joy and happiness in this world, and we should nurture that within ourselves. We're much more productive people when we're happy people, uh, or when we have something that that we has a goal that can keep us going forward, knowing that we'll have some joy and happiness down the road in some way, shape, or form. And so, uh, you know, one of the joys that I had was snowboarding. You know, I was a avid snowboarder. You know, uh, surfing. You know, is an indigenous tradition from the Kingdom of Hawaii. Surfing begets skateboarding. I was a skateboarder in the 70s and, and snowboarding, a skateboarding begets snowboarding. So, you know, it goes surfing, skateboarding, snowboarding in that order of how these sports evolved. Um, and, and they all come from an indigenous tradition from the King of Hawaii of surfing. So, you know, that was the joy for me, being on the mountain, being in the community of borders. You know, so I always took time to snowboard when I could um, because it, it renewed, re renewed my spirit. It nourished my spirit in some way and brought me joy and happiness. So I just remind people, yeah, yes, we have work and the work will always be there to ensure that we have the health and vitality of indigenous peoples and indigenous nations. But we also have to take the time to nourish our own spirit joy so that, you know, we have the happiness that can sustain us and keep us going in times of challenge. Thank you so much for your time. This was the Collective Impact Podcast. To stay on top of any updates or to learn more about who we are and what we do, please check out our website, which will be linked to whatever platform you're listening to this on. Other affiliated links will also be available. This was your host, Mina Yildiz, and I hope to see you next time.